Well, hello friends and welcome to Ask Zach. Today we continue our Influential Albums series and we'll be talking about Dwight Yoakam's Guitars, Cadillacs, etc., etc., produced by the great Pete Anderson. We're going to talk about uh, some of the tracks on it, some of the gear used by Pete. We're going to talk about its kind of enduring legacy, uh, some of the backstory. It's, uh, it's a great one, so I hope you enjoy. First off, I need to thank all of my uh, Patreon folks who really keep this show going. I'm very grateful to them, and if you'd like to join them, uh, see the link in the description. All right, let's dive in. I think we need to have a little bit of a backstory here so that we have some context. So, of course, and I'm not going to give you the, uh, the full-on bio of Dwight and Pete, but I'm going to give you the nickel version of it. Of course, Dwight was from Kentucky, and he had moved to Los Angeles and was struggling to make it as a performer and songwriter in the early 1980s. Pete was originally from Detroit, and mainly in, at his core, I think it's fair to say he was a blues guitarist. While in Los Angeles, Pete began to really take in country guitar styles and especially started pulling in some pedal steel type licks and such that he was learning how to do while using a volume pedal. They were, Pete and Dwight were introduced to each other by Bob Bernstein, who's a, a pedal steel player. And at this point, both of our main characters, Dwight and Pete, were kind of getting to the point of, of uh, really needing to put everything they had on the table. Uh, Dwight, of course, had been struggling for a couple of years. Uh, Pete had been struggling longer. Pete was almost 40 at this point in the early 1980s, and <clears throat> he felt that, uh, that Dwight was kind of his last best chance for a successful career in the music business. With this in mind, they really started adding all the fuel they could to the fire. One of the things they did was a focus on their live show. Part of it was they were playing for punk crowds, and because of this, they had to have an energetic stage show. They couldn't just stand there and perform. Also, as part of this, they had to have a look, an appearance. And if you look at footage of, uh, like, like this picture, of Dwight playing pre-Pete Anderson, he and the band look like they just walked up from the bar, and Dwight kind of looks like his character from Sling Blade. Uh, it's in this time of working with Pete, they, uh, and I'm not sure whose idea it was, but while they were collaborating, they decided that they needed a better stage appearance, and that's when you get the Dwight look that we think of today with the cowboy hat, the tight jeans, the short jackets, and you start seeing Pete wearing the western suits and the other guys in the band following suit. Most interestingly, uh, or I guess one, one of the characters that uh, got uh, one of the most uh, interesting looks was Brantley Kearns, the fiddle player who was given these uh, bib overalls to wear and, uh, and a hat. That's, uh, you know, and, and other characters even uh, in the band had to carry on that look much later. So, they, uh, with the support of their fans, they were able to make an EP. And this was done for Oak Records, and it only had six cuts on it. Now, what's really interesting about this is that the EP has the same artwork and the same title that the Warner Brothers album would have that would be released in 1986. Now, this Oak album was released in 1984. This album sold enough copies and got enough praise from the critics that Warner Brothers began uh, you know, reaching out to, to Dwight. And so they ended up inking a deal in 1985. And part of the deal was that they would release the Oak recording, but with additional tracks. So 
This is where it gets interesting to me is that the, uh, the four tracks that were added on were included Guitars, Cadillacs, and uh, Honky Tonk Man. And it just blows my mind that they already had the title of the album, Guitars, Cadillacs, etc., etc. Right here. Uh, before they had the song. And, and also the fact that Honky Tonk Man, which was the, the lead single off the Warner Reprise album, they, uh, they had not recorded those yet. So those were recorded at, uh, at the Capitol you know, Studios in Hollywood. And they added those tracks. And Dwight wrote the, the guitar's Cadillac song with the inspiration of, of talking to another player about, you know, about what that music was all about. And they were talking about it being guitars, Cadillacs, and long-legged women and such. And uh, he just changed it to hillbilly music. Uh, I think that works a little better than uh, long-legged women. So, with, uh, with the support of Warner Brothers behind them, they were able to, uh, to have a, a, a huge launch of the album. They were able to get promotion and they began uh, hitting the scene. Uh, let's talk about some of the tracks off the original album. Uh, Honky Tonk Man is real interesting. Of course, that's a cover, uh, and that was their first single. What's interesting about that tune is that <clears throat> the intro and solo are both played by Dwight on acoustic guitar. So you get to hear Dwight's a pretty good guitar player, as you know, we. A lot of us found that out more later on as he played more guitar on some of his later recordings after Post Pete. But uh, yeah, Dwight's a pretty good guitar player. Now, of course, Pete's playing the electric guitar parts that you hear and the, and the fills, but the, uh, the intro and the solo were both uh, Dwight Yoakam playing acoustic. Uh, then, of course, you have Guitars Cadillacs, which is just a... Uh, an amazingly wonderful tune that's also a huge tribute to Bakersfield. And it's here I need to hit on the fact that this album was able to take all of the Bakersfield influences, including, of course, the obvious ones like you know, Buck Owens and Merle Haggard, but it was also able to take in things like Red Simpson and some of the trucker kind of... Um, you know, music that was coming out of Bakersfield in Los Angeles, and it was able to really meld them together in a way that was in some ways a tribute, yet it was also new. It never sounded like, you know, some weird pastiche or anything like that. It was original songs, <clears throat> guitar playing that was kind of in the Bakersfield style, but even the tone, the attack, and uh, the note choices were kind of all, you know, Pete Anderson. And I think part of what made that uh, possible was Pete's background in blues. And if you take even something like that opening, you know, solo that I played, which was Pete's solo on uh, Guitars Cadillacs, uh, you have this first part of the solo that's just kind of, you know, restating the, the opening lick in a way. You know, the... But with the second half, you get kind of a, a you know, Freddie King almost kind of, you know, blues lick. I mean, let's just do the... You know, kind of going into a, uh, a, uh, a lick, again, in the, in the style. You also have, on his second solo, you have these really nice kind of faux pedal steel bends. You have this kind of walk up. You have the... I did 
take a little bit of liberty at the, the tail end of that second half. But those were things that, uh, that Pete had learned and uh, that were really nice kind of additions to the Bakersfield guitar style, which hadn't heard as much of that. You know, even, uh, even James, who would use sixth and stuff, you really didn't hear that much of the, the double string bends <clears throat> where they weren't on consecutive strings. So that was kind of a, an interesting addition to the, uh, to the Bakersfield kind of tonal palette of guitar sounds. I think also uh, the, uh, Pete had his own sound that had a, uh, a little bit more aggressive and a little bit dirtier especially on the live recordings, the, uh, the live at the Roxy, which again, this is the, uh, the deluxe edition of guitars, Cadillacs, et cetera, et cetera, which is of course available uh, digitally. And so this has the original Warner Reprise album. It has the 1981 demos, which include, you know, things that were, that would be on later albums like I Sang Dixie and uh, You're the One and such. And then it has the, uh, Live at the Roxy in 1986. And the Live at the Roxy is where you really get to hear Pete stretch out and do some really wonderful things. And you get to hear a really dirty, it's not distorted, but it's a really wonderfully dirty clean tone, if that makes sense. And uh, the, the things that he does uh, on a number of the tunes, even on the track Mystery Train, so of course that, that's the cover, it, uh, he does this harmonic thing that was mainly done by rock players, but he, he starts to... Which again, that was done a lot by rock guys or even Eddie Van Halen, where they would just lightly touch the A and E strings uh, while they're picked it like that, it kind of gives you kind of a flangery kind of sound. And uh, yeah, Pete did some really nice things on there. Another track that uh, I really enjoy off the live from the Roxy is the uh, Since I Started Drinking Again is where you get to hear Pete doing what I think of as his kind of finger as a capo. And then he starts playing these kind of open string licks where he's using his first finger as a, as a capo and he starts doing these kind of rolling thing. All of these, you know, kind of open string rolling things. Uh, playing the major third against the minor third and uh, yeah, doing some really really nice work. Another thing to hit back on the uh, the demos that were that were recorded in 1981 that are part of this you know kind of deluxe um, packaging. It's interesting in that they had 21 really great original songs that Dwight had written, and Pete was wise enough to know that they should separate those songs out and that they should put seven on each of the first four albums, first three albums, and then add three covers. So with, of course, the original Warner Reprise album, you get uh, seven originals, and then you get the covers of, you know, Honky Tonk Man, and, uh, you know, Heartaches by the Number, and uh, Ring of Fire and such. And, uh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the, the gear on the, on the album. You know, of course, Pete, he had you know, his 59 Telecaster Custom, but the guitar that's actually featured the most on it is a, uh, a mid-50s Maple Neck Telecaster that he called Ruby, and I'll show a picture of it real quick here. That guitar had been refinished, and he used that for most of the album. And so that's, that's kind of a... Uh, most people think of this album as being the example of a Rosewood board Telecaster, but it's not. It's actually the sound of a mid-50s Telecaster, but it is through his deluxe reverb amplifiers. And those were, of course, heavily modified. They had different output transformers put in them. They used 6L6s, 
which immediately makes it a very different animal than a regular blackface deluxe reverb. Uh, to add to that, he had the, uh, the mid-range control, which of course it, you immediately you're saying, well, a deluxe reverb doesn't have a mid-range control. Well, it does, it's just set internally, um, but there's not an actual knob. And it's basically set internally to like two or three. And so Pete's tech modified it to where the mid-range was on 10, which is not gonna make a night and day difference, but it does give it a, more of a mid-range sound. The other final ingredient, besides of course the, uh, the change in the output transformer and output tubes and the mid-range, would be the change in speaker. So in one of the deluxes, it had all those mods and an Altec speaker. And then in the other, it had a Electrovoice speaker, but a lot of people think it was the EVM-12L, but it was actually the evm 12 S. And so the 12 S is very similar to the L except it has a shallower basket and it was designed more for lead guitar or lead instruments. And it is again a big heavy ceramic magnet speaker not to be confused of course with the earlier SRO or the Alnico magnet uh, EV speakers that were made in the uh, in the 70s. But that was kind of his sound along with a Goodrich active volume pedal, meaning it had, a, it had a battery and a preamp in it, a buffer, basically. And he had a uh, Boss CE1, or Roland CE1, chorus unit that was used at a very low setting, uh, and it wasn't used all the time. And then a Echoplex, and usually the Echo was only set to one amplifier. So he would basically have a wet, dry rig, where one amplifier got the straight signal from the guitar through the Goodrich volume pedal, and then the second amp got the chorus and the echoplex going to it. And so he kind of had a, uh, a wet dry rig, you know, as far as, uh, you know, which I can't think of anyone in country music that had a wet dry rig earlier than that. So quite uh, impressive. Uh, other things about uh, his, his sound or rig. I think, I think the next thing would be the influence of it. So once everyone in Nashville heard these albums, it, uh, this album, I should say, they were, the players especially were excited because they were wanting to play more guitar amp sounds while the popular sound of the day would have been a Strat with usually EMG pickups into a chorus unit that the chorus was on in a substantial way and then usually recorded direct. And again, this, we're talking about 1986 when the album gets released on Warner Reprise. So uh, Ray Flack uh, you know, was, was one of the guys that was uh, you know, excited because of that, because that, he wasn't wanting to play that direct sound and such. He liked using his Lab Series amp and, and didn't want to be swimming in chorus. Another would be Brent Mason. Brent Mason told me in an interview that he really enjoyed uh, Pete Anderson's work. And part of it was the fact that his playing was really interesting. And then also the guitar tone that he came up with was so much more in your face than the uh, direct chorus tones, you know, stratty sounds that they were getting, especially because they were using the the number two or the or the number four position, you know, the kind of clucky kind of sound that's a little bit less uh, direct and in your face sounding. So, yeah, had a huge effect. Of course, it also you know launched Dwight and uh, Pete's career, and they were able to do two more records just on the, the songs that they already had in their, uh, in their bag. And then they just added a number, you know, three or four covers, you know, on the, on the next couple albums. The, uh, yeah. You know. Might have to pause here for a moment. Uh, 
I just love this album. It's uh, it's one of my favorites. I remember hearing this you know, on the radio. I remember hearing, you know, guitars, Cadillacs, and just being blown away by the sound of it. The album and the song, the song just sounded unlike anything else that was on the radio at the time. Because again, everyone was kind of going for more of a pop crossover, you know, kind of country sound with, uh, again, chorused, you know, electric guitar that was direct. And to hear the sound of an amp and a Telecaster on the back pickup that was really twangy uh, was, was quite, uh, yeah, it was quite the shock and uh, it, it meant a lot. And it kind of set things in motion where you got albums like the Desert Rose Band would come out with their first album the next year. And you heard, of course, John Jorgensen playing a Telecaster through an AC-30, which was another, you know, you know kind of departure from what was going on in country music. And then even, uh, you know, Brent Mason, has indicated that you know with the Brooks and Dunn records that he played on, they were trying to not necessarily. They, they certainly weren't trying to sound like Dwight Yoakam, but they were trying to get more of that beer hall, dance hall kind of sound, and they wanted to use amps. And so he, you know, Dwight, not Dwight, Brent Mason specifically used a uh, a lot of those tracks were. Uh, you know, a deluxe reverb on the uh, Brooks and Dunn early hits and such on the ones where they got away from not having to go direct. So quite a fantabulous uh, album, hugely influential on, uh, on country music and the way albums were made. And, uh, and just to be, you know, blunt, there were a lot of copycats that were done in Nashville and where people started dressing like Dwight Yoakam, people started wearing jean jackets and bolo ties and uh, and such and started going for more of a honky-tonk sound and that became a thing because whenever something is popular or becomes cool well there's going to be copycats so all right guys well i just want to thank you for watching today i hope you will listen to uh, dwight yoakam's guitar cadillacs etc etc especially the deluxe edition which has the uh, the demos, the songwriter demos, and then it has the live tracks from the Roxy, which I, I really love. And uh, yeah, check those out. And again, I want to thank all my Patreon people. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.